This is Gail Morgan thanking you for watching the Libertarian Counterpoint each Thursday at 8 p.m. Channel 17 on Comcast, on YouTube, and on Facebook. Thank you for joining us today. Um, I'm James Just, your host. Our normal co-host is Richard Fields over there in your upper right. We've got John Cameron down in your lower left. And with us today is vice presidential candidate from the Libertarian Party, Spike Cohen. And Spike, if I abs if I accidentally call you Spike Owen, I apologize. That's okay. Don't worry about it. <laughs> and now, now you have my full attention. I just shared this on my uh, on my on my page, so everyone can join in. So, no, if you call me Spike Owen, that's fine. There's an old baseball player who I used to follow back in the '80s, who's Spike Owen. No, I, I know who Spike Owen <laughs> is. I've, you're you're not the first one to to, to write down O W E N when when saying yeah, my name. Oh my God, it happens all the time. All right. I was thinking, I was thinking, finally a candidate that could hit, but that's just me. So, you know. well, I hope to be a hit. <laughs> All right, yeah, and, and I'm sure you will be. <laughs> Thank but you. In order to be a hit, you got to get past the gotcha questions. What do you? What's your answer? What's your stock answer to the Vermin Supreme, free ponies, uh, kill the baby Hitler by going back in time, and uh, and uh, and the uh, self descri your self description as an anarchist. What's oh, your, your standard answer to the, all of those questions? Oh, absolutely. Listen, if those are the toughest questions, then I think we're going to be sailing tonight. Um, so it, let's go with the, the satire stuff first. Satire is an incredibly powerful way to reach people who are so disgusted by the way things are going in this country that they don't want to hear anything from any politician. The reason why we see that more and more people are getting their news from The Daily Show and late night news and their favorite podcast, comedy podcasters, is because... They're just disgusted by things. When someone comes to them and says, hi, I'm such and such with you know the Republicans or the Democrats, they don't want to hear it. They, they recognize that the Democrats and the Republicans and, and their, their craven major media is, has uh, driven the political discourse to the level of such a joke that they don't even want to participate anymore. And so they've completely divorced themselves. you got something like, what, 40, 45% of Americans that do not vote. They're eligible. They do not vote. And if you look for the reasons why they, vote, they don't vote, whenever they're asked in focus groups or anything else, we hear the same things over and over again. This system isn't designed for me. Politicians all lie. You can't trust anything they say. The whole thing's a joke. Uh, you know, it's, it's gamed against me. It, there's no reason for me to be voting. These are all pretty libertarian reasons to not be participating. And if we could reach them, then they could pretty much, you know, join the, the movement and recognize that they have a home, but they don't want to hear from anyone. If I show up and I go, Hey, I'm Spike Cohen. And I'm here to talk to you about radical self-ownership. They don't want to hear a thing. They've already uh, labeled me a politician and they've already completely shut me off. But when a satirist reaches them, when a comedian reaches them, when someone like Vermin reaches them, now they're listening. Now they want to hear what 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 it is because they're being entertained. They understand there's a political message there, but they're just being entertained. And they get they like that the person is treating it like the joke they believe that it deserves to be treated like. And so their cognitive defenses are being lowered because they're in on the joke. They're not being lied to or pandered to. They're just being entertained and they're being, you know, nudge, nudge, wink, wink that, you know, they recognize the system's a joke too. And it's called the boot pill method. We brought in a ton of people using it. Now with that said, and, I, and I'm very grateful that, you know, Vermin has been bringing so many people into the party and that he's helping Joe and I in our campaign to bring uh, common sense libertarian solutions to solve the problems that the Democrats and the Republicans have faced. Now with that said, even when I was running uh, alongside Vermin as his, as his proposed running mate, I always ran a serious campaign. I was always in a serious way of doing it. I would engage in satire when I saw it as appropriate, but I always ran seriously. This is a serious campaign. We are running on serious issues and we are running on, uh, you know, changing the way that things are happening in this country, moving it away from the Democrats and Republicans who have had exclusive control of every lever of political power for over 150 years in this country and moving it towards our solutions, libertarian common sense solutions. When it comes to anarchy, the, the logical end conclusion of, of libertarian thought on things like self-ownership, bodily autonomy, uh, uh, non-aggression and, and voluntary solutions in the market is that all things should be provided in a way by the free market. Um, that's not what we're running on. We are running on solving the acute problems that have been created by Republicans and Democrats and introducing libertarian solutions to solve those. So, you know, we're not out here talking about spreading anarchy. We're not talking about, you know, uh, you know, privatizing everything or anything like that. We're talking about ending the wars. We're talking about ending the drug war. We're talking about ending qualified immunity. We're talking about getting government out of healthcare so that it can be affordable. We're talking about getting government out of education so it can be affordable. We're talking about ending the crises that have been created or made worse by Republicans and Democrats. All right, good. Um, hey, Spike, as a candidate myself, is running for office, kind of as a long shot candidate, I have the three miracle methods, is what I'm calling running for office. I need three miracles. Two have already actually happened, so that's kind of cool. But what is your guys' path to victory? 
So our path, I see it as pretty straightforward. Uh, it, it, Gary Johnson and Bill Weld got, uh, in one opinion poll, they got 13%. And in another one, they got 11%. And the threshold to get in the debates is 15%. And if I believe, and in that four years since Gary and Bill were running in 2016, what's happened in those four years? Things have gotten worse. The candidates that they put forward are even more toxic than last time. And more possibly more importantly, major media has less of a share of an audience that it had before. And social media, where we have a much greater pull and, and, and a much more natural constituency, has an even larger share. So I believe that those things will combine for us to be able to get that 15% that we need. And of course, we're, we're working hard. We're So far, we've been surpassing all of our volunteering and fundraising goals. We've had tens of thousands of people sign up to, to join our, our group and to join our, to become volunteers across the country. We've surpassed every single fundraising goal that we have. And we are, um, and we are I believe we're going to get that 15% that we need in the opinion polls to get on the debate stage. And when that happens, when you take... Donald Trump and Joe Biden, two utter buffoons who can barely form a coherent sentence behind uh, between the two of them, and more importantly, are emblematic of everything that is wrong with politics in this country. There are two people, a career politician and a career crony turned politician, two men who are knee deep in every single bad thing that has come as a result of the exclusive control of by the Republicans and Democrats in this country. And then in between them, you have Joe Jorgensen, an absolutely brilliant, self-made entrepreneur, a woman who's ready to lead from day one, a, a, a senior lecturer who's able to break down complex ideas in a way that are connecting and uh, relatable to everyday Americans who can point by point and case by case and item by item break down exactly how Joe Biden and Donald Trump and their parties have failed the American people and how her ideas, common sense, libertarian solution ideas are the are the way to forward and the way to fix the problems that they've created. And of course, you put me on a debate stage with Mike Pence, who's still deciding whether government should be able to uh, electrocute homosexuals, and probably Kamala Harris, a woman who's best known for what I call attempted murder. And you can judge for yourself. She illegally withheld exculpatory evidence in a capital murder case. A judge ordered her to release evidence that she knew would, would find a man that she was trying to have executed not guilty because he didn't do it. And she still tried to withhold it illegally after the order. I would love to give her an opportunity to explain to the American people how that's not attempted murder. And then, you know, Mike Pence can explain if he still wants to shock gay people. And I think between what Joe is going to be able to do in contrast with the other idiots on the stage and what I'll be able to do with the same, I think it's a no-brainer. I think that we'll win that. Given the uh, long shot of getting on the debate stage, what's what's the go around? So I don't consider it a long shot. I think that it's a lot more attainable than most than many think that it is. Uh, but with that said, if we're not able to get on it, we continue to do the viral marketing that we're doing. We continue to grow things at the grassroots level. We are making uh, uh, more so than any other candidate before before uh, any other campaign before us. We are making a huge point of pulling up the grassroots, pulling up the down ballot candidates. Um, and, and James, you should reach out to me. I know you're running for state assembly. I want to help promote you. Uh, we're going across the country promoting candidates, everything from local races, statewide races, regional races, and other federal races, senators, congressmen, uh, you know, uh, statewide races like governor, pulling them up. We're also encouraging at the regional and at the state affiliate level, getting the grassroots involved, doing on door knocking and petition signing and phone calling and phone banking. This is going to be a, a, a top, a bottom up, grassroots campaign. So we do believe we're going to get on the debate stage. And once that happens, there's going to be a real emperor's emperor has no clothes moments there where people see that, you know, the inevitable two choices that they were supposed to, that they were told that they could only choose from are going to be completely upended by someone that they hadn't heard from until about a week or so prior. And, uh, and I think that we'll win based on that. But even if we don't, we're going to see an unprecedented amount of votes and, uh, and an unprecedented amount of people joining the party on the strength of the grassroots viral campaign that we're building. So, Spike, I have, I have a, a question for, well, two questions for you, really. And it's mm -hmm. uh, your position on when you're talking about grassroots and pulling people up and that great mass of people, if there wasn't a label that said libertarian and they were asked what they feel about things, they'd be libertarian. Uh, two big issues for, for a lot of people in this country are uh, health care and defense. Mm -hmm. uh, tell me, tell me what you think about those two issues, please. Well, let's start with healthcare. 
Uh, I've done door knocking tours in housing projects. I've done tours in college campuses. I've gone in tours uh, across various housing communities of, of all different, uh, all different, you know, types of neighborhoods, uh, very diverse things. I've gone to different types of protests. Uh, and I've talked to people uh, of all different across the political spectrum uh, of every race, creed, color uh, and, and age. And what I'm hearing across the board is that and it's same thing with education as well, is that they can't afford their health care. Most Americans, even those who aren't what we'd consider poor, they're one emergency room visit away from being in a very bad financial situation, and most of them from being financially ruined. Uh, and forget if they end up with a, a chronic health issue or something like that that has, on need, has ongoing care needs. It's a huge mess. It costs an absolute fortune. We have a system that was created by cronies that has been put in place by their favored, craven, pandering politicians who you know show up, say whatever lie they need to to get elected, and then just sign off endless legislation to do what? create barriers that keep the wealthy wealthier at the expense of the rest of us. In the case of healthcare, what do we see? We see that the existing healthcare providers have forced them to uh, create these certificate of need laws, which basically say that in order for you to uh, build a new hospital or to uh, build a new medical center, you have to scrape and beg your local mun municipality. You have to do what we have to do, get petitions signed and you know beg to say that you know there's enough people here that need our services, which artificially reduces the supply of healthcare, which in the best of conditions drives up the cost and, and, and lowers, the, uh, lowers the amount of access. And in conditions like now, it makes it so that we've got to run on hospital beds and ICU beds. Um, you've got situations with patent protection where the uh, where pharmaceutical companies are able to completely stop researching and developing new drugs that, you know, that would be better than their old ones. And instead they just jack up the prices on their old drugs. And, and because, and they can do that because they have the patent protection. And if they do decide to make a new drug, they just externalize the cost using the FDA. They make us pay for it. If we want to have the drug that we then have to pay top dollar for, because we can't leave and go to another country and buy a drug and bring it back where that drug is legal there and legal here, but bringing it across those uh, national lines is illegal because they want us to pay top dollar after we had to use our tax dollars to pay for its research and development in the first place. And we aren't allowed to sue them if something goes wrong with that drug. They indemnify. I mean, we talk about qualified immunity for police officers. We have qualified immunity for pharmaceutical companies. All of these things contribute to a system that is designed to make healthcare unaffordable for one reason, to get us to sign off on just fine, go ahead, take it over, give us single payer healthcare, nationalized healthcare, whatever, just put us out of our misery with this. It's too unaffordable. We're having restrictions to access anyway. Just do what you will. Now, the problem is we often aren't sympathizing with the people or empathizing with the people that are coming to us with this problem about healthcare. When they start telling us their problems and start telling us that, you know, their healthcare costs are so high, they can't afford it. It's ruining them financially. They're going to go bankrupt because they got sick one time and that, you know, they think healthcare is a right. And that, you know, why can't we be like the other countries that have free healthcare? What did we hear? Healthcare is a right. Other countries have free healthcare and we attack them on that. We try to win an argument with someone that just emoted to us how scared they are. And unfortunately, when we do that, we drive home the stereotype about libertarians that we don't care about anything else, that we just want to protect our own money and that we don't care what happens to other people. We hate the poor. We hate the elderly. We hate children. And when we try to present people with arguments instead of using the, you know, the tried and, and proven methods of making friends and influencing people uh, to try to reach them. That's what ends up happening. So what I do instead is I empathize with their situation. This is terrible that what's going on with healthcare. This is an absolute mess of a system. And I talk about the things that we just talked about, what drives up those costs. And then I say, the problem is the people that are also empathizing with you are telling you that the same foxes that keep letting their fellow foxes raid the hen house are the ones who say they want to complete control. The ones who are making healthcare unaffordable for you with the barriers they've put in place are the ones saying that they want to be the ones who decide if you even get it or not. And you only need to ask someone who's relying on the VA, whether that's a good system or not. And so then you can take them on the journey with how every single time from FDR's wage caps, which led to comprehensive health care as an as a, as a, a end run around the wage caps uh, to, you know, the introduction of Medicare and Medicare, the introduction of Medicare Part D, the introduction of Obamacare and everything in between there that has led to an ever increasing skyrocketing of prices and an ever reduction of access to affordable care. Once you take them on that journey, they see that just like anything else, healthcare needs to belong to an actual free market, 
but you got to empathize with them first. You have to reach them where they are in their places and in their precepts. Same thing with defense. Why do people think that we need this ever growing empire that's bombing and destabilizing and invading entire countries? It's because they're scared. It's because they're told if we don't do that, another 9-11 is going to happen or something even worse than 9-11 is going to happen. The terrorists are going to come with nuclear weapons and destroy everything. A foreign country, China is going to come and invade our country. If we don't fight them over there, we're going to have to fight them over here. I used to be a neocon. I bought that lie. I bought that the reason that these people were fighting us was because they hated us for our very freedoms and that we had to use every possible uh, tool in our arsenal to use to spread our peaceful ways to them by hook or by crook, bomb as many people as possible until they too bought our freedom and, and democracy. And then I realized something. Ron Paul was right. It was all just blowback. It was all just a scam to make us scared and to make us buy into their empire. Why? just to make Raytheon rich and to make Blackwater rich and to make Northrop Grunman and Boeing and the countless other military contractors in the industrial complex rich, the, 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 the endless patronage between officials in government who then become lobbyists for contractors. We see that in every single sector, healthcare, defense, education, the prison system, everything. And in this case with defense, we've been told, like with all those other things, to be scared. We've been made hopeless and anxious. And then we have a bad bill of goods sold to us. And all we have to do is reach people where they are, have them recognize, first of all, empathize with their concerns, demonstrate to them why the people that they want to give more control of, more control to are the ones who created the problem and then take them on the journey to liberty, liberty, that the real solution is less involvement from them. The uh, the analogy that you made, or the point that you made about uh, Conlaws, uh, the uh, uh, principle applies also to a number of other uh, crafts and industries. Mm -hmm. uh, for instance, hair braiders and uh, oh, yeah. uh, landscapers and yep. uh, pesticide uh, people. Any number of things uh, have to be sure. licensed. This is at the state level, but uh, is it at the federal level as well? The federal level, where the federal level involvement is that that's a violation of your First Amendment right. That is a violation of your right to be able to do business. Um, and we believe that that is a, a case for the Justice Department. Because, and especially when you look at what it's rooted in. The very first certificate, certificate uh, or uh, 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 occupational licensing laws were put in place to stop freed slaves from being able to do work. So because they were told, okay, you're free, just keep doing what you were doing, but now we'll give you some money, but we're still gonna basically treat you the same way. You're still gonna live where you used to live. You're gonna be a sharecropper. And a lot of them said, I don't wanna work for the, the guy who used to claim ownership of me and used to abuse me. I'm gonna go get a career. I, I, I do have some ability to do some things. I'm gonna go start a business and I'm gonna work for less than these established people and I'm gonna disrupt the market and you know provide more value for service and all of that. And the government thought, we can't allow that. And so they introduced occupational licensing laws. When I went to uh, housing projects, when I was knocking on housing projects, something like, I don't know, 80% of the people that I talked to, all of them had a side hustle. I went there to talk about criminal justice reform, police brutality, and ending the war on drugs. Thankfully, I was smart enough to say, okay, before you do that, listen to what they have to say. They weren't talking about that. They were talking about police brutality. Their big thing was, I'm trying to get ahead in life. And every time I do, the cops come and take my equipment. They come in and, you know, Rot, they come and you know uh, give me a citation for not having a license. Their big thing was that they were trying to get out of public housing and get ahead in life. And as soon as they got big enough to actually start making some serious money, here came the police to to stop their entire operation. And they couldn't afford the occupational licensing laws. They couldn't afford running up tens of thousands of dollars in debt so that they can braid hair for a living. They couldn't afford that, and so they couldn't do it. And or they just do it, but they do it illegally. They all had side hustles. So by the by the end of the time that I was there, I was knocking on doors and saying, hi, my name's Spike Cohen. I'm running for vice president. And I just want to get the cops off your back so you can, you know, do the things that you're doing to get ahead in life. And they'd light up. We, we had dozens of them sign up for the Libertarian Party of North Carolina where we were. But the point of that is exactly what you said, Richard, the the occupational licensing laws are the government robbing you and saying, if you want to do a thing, you have to pay us up front first. Then once you start making money, of course, we're going to take from that as well in the form of, of various taxes and fees. But it is a massive barrier to entry. And the poorer you are, the less of an inconvenience it becomes. 
And the more of a straight up barrier that you cannot overcome or is nearly impossible to overcome, it becomes, it is the criminalization of people who are poor trying to get in, ahead in life. And it is a major, major problem. Uh, surprise, surprise, in every single aspect of life, here is a government barrier, which just so happens to have been introduced by much more established, pl established players in that given sector who don't want competition. And they sold it as a protection for consumers. It's not a protection for consumers. It's a protection for the people who are in charge. Yeah, and it's not just, and it's not just the, um, the money. It's the complexity. Yep. It, yeah, you might be able to scrounge up 500 bucks, but you've got to fill out paperwork with six different government agencies to get your permit and then, yep. and then hope that someone doesn't kick it back to you because you didn't forget a comma or something. You and, if you, and if you have a felony record because you, you once you know sold a dime bag to someone, you can't get it. Yeah. Because that's the other part of the war on drugs. We focus on the fact that they get put on cages, put in cages, which is terrible. And, you know, they have to become, uh, you know, people that w uh, and most drug dealers and they don't talk about this. Most drug dealers are people who are drug addicts who are selling the drugs so they can continue to afford it. You know, when we think drug dealers, we think of these drug kingpins. The vast majority of people that are in prison were drug addicts and they still are drug addicts. Now they're drug addicts in prison and they're not getting help. What they're doing is they're having to become hardened in order to survive in there. And then when they get out, now they've been jaded. They have countless amounts of PTSD and other psychological trauma. The world doesn't look a thing like it did when they got out. They're pro possibly even still addic addicted to drugs. Their credit's been ruined because their social security number was out there floating around and they weren't out to be able to fight all the charges that, you know, all the fraudulent charges people were running up in their on their social security number. That's a whole other uh, racket that people don't talk about. So everything's real. Oh, and they have a felony record, so they can't really get a good job or get an occupational license or anything like that. So they have to choose between abject poverty, living on uh, living on the social assistance, uh, social safety net and welfare, uh, or they have to choose um, being a wage slave for some other established person making next to nothing, uh, doing work that they could be doing themselves, making a good living or going back to crime which doesn't scare them because the outside world is almost as scary to them as prison got. They've been desensitized to it. And that's what the system was designed for because most states have a quota for a minimum number of you, the American people that have to be in that prison at any given time. Why? Because they have contracts with for-profit prison labor contractors who make tens of billions of dollars a year contracting slave labor. Some of them are so profitable, they're listed on the stock market because the 13th, 13th, the 13th Amendment did not end chattel slavery. It just took it out of the hands of the private sector and gave it exclusively to government. And now it makes sense that something like 80% of the people that are in jail are people of color and other religious and ethnic minorities. It makes sense that they simply changed who was in charge of it, but didn't change the outcome. It is designed for that. It is designed so that people who are below a certain level of stature are kept there forever and made helpless and anxious and scared and that their only hope is total reliance on government. That is the intention. We are constantly distracted by Democrats and Republicans by uh, cultural issues, yep. uh, abortion and so on. Mm -hmm. What's your uh, way of distracting from those essential, well, I won't call them non-issues because they're very important to certain right. constituencies. They're very important. But yeah. to, for, for, for a lot of people, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's really not uh, an economic issue. It's, not, it's really a, a kind of a, something, uh, you know, it's a second or third tier issue. Mm -hmm. how, how, do you, how do you deal with those? Part of the journey that I have to take people on when, when I'm doing our messaging is that everything that you are being told in the in the greater body politic of, of what is being introduced to you by major media, by the Republicans and the Democrats, it's all a lie. The This illusion that the entire spectrum of serious political thought is Republicans and Democrats and you know moderates and centrists somewhere in between, and that anyone else is just some kind of crazy person who doesn't even make sense. But that that's where the real deal is. That's what really matters. And that you know you know I'll have people say, well, would you consider yourself more of a Democrat or a Republican? And I'll say they're the same. I'm completely different. And the idea of them being the same blows their mind because all they hear is how you know the Democrats and the Republicans are fighting tooth and nail. And if if they're more left leaning, the Democrats are you know they're not good, but they're so much better than those evil Republicans. Or if you lean right, those Republicans. Republicans, I'm not a huge fan of them, but man, at least they're fighting against those terrible Democrats. But when you can when you can start taking them on that journey and have them step back for a moment and realize, 
they're exactly the same. It doesn't matter which side gets elected. You get endless war, you get endless taxation, endless debt spending, you get endless people putting in, being put in cages for slave labor, you get endless mistreatment, you get endless harmful, abusive, and inequitable outcomes that come as a result of bad, centrally planned, arbitrarily defined, and crony-friendly policies of Republicans and Democrats working hand-in-hand -hand together. Once you take them on that journey, now stuff like abortion, you're able to say, hey, listen, They've created this issue that is only matters if you believe that we should coerce others into doing things the way that we want to. And abortion is a tough one because you can, if you believe that, if you're pro-life, you believe that we're talking about a person who has rights. And so it's hard to, to, to message that. It's actually probably the hardest thing to message because they're not even agreeing with you on the precept that, you know, it's, it's just a matter of whether or not you can let people do their own thing or not, because in their mind, uh, you know, there's a, there's an actual a, a, another human being that has rights involved. And that takes a little bit more messaging about the kind of world that we would live in if we gave constitutionally defined rights to recently conceived embryos and what that would look like. You know, what the, 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 you know, a, a woman who just had a miscarriage now having to go through a wrongful death uh, investigation or, you know, a woman who's had multiple miscarriages being told by a judge, she can't continue to try to get pregnant because it's negligent homicide if she keeps doing it and so forth. But that's, that's a little bit tougher one, but most of the hobby ho horse social issues like transgender bathrooms, which are important to transgender people and kind of a hobby horse thing for everyone else. Uh, same sex marriage, which is important to same sex people and kind of a hobby horse for everyone else. When you take them on the journey that these are social issues that are intended to divide us so we don't step back and realize that the Republicans and Democrats are fighting against us, and that once you remove force from the equation, once you remo remove the coercion from the equa equation, and you simply allow people to do what they will, and they don't let they allow you to do what you will, providing no one harms each other or, or takes their stuff or aggresses upon each other, now suddenly that's a lot easier. We have hardcore social conservatives in the liberty movement who think that you know same-sex marriage is a total violation of their religious beliefs, but they're fine with saying, hey, they're over there doing that. I'm fine with that as long as they don't try to make me agree with it or, or participate in it and vice versa. You have people that are, you know, LGBT or, or just very socially progressive who say, you know, this person over here, I consider them personally, I consider them a bigot, but as long as they're not trying to enforce their rules and their laws against me, I'm not going to try to get them to accept my lifestyle. They can be over there and I'll, you know, I'll give my opinion about them, but I'm not going to try to, you know, I'm not going to try to force them to do something by, under penalty of law. That's how people can coexist under libertarianism by removing that forced to association and that coercion and we have about 30 seconds left spike is there anything you want to let everybody else know wait how, how long are we booked for half an, an hour, hour. It's all oh no time. oh no guys i'm so sorry i would have given shorter answers i'm used to these oh. being an hour long well these folks uh, anyway i i really appreciate your time i hope you were did you get did you were you able to get all your questions answered yeah 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 we're good oh, okay yeah, good good, good. I, this this flew by you guys Put are such great hosts <laughs> well, okay. So, uh, folks, you decided to shut up and let you talk. That was the thing. Thing. Well, so. thank you. That that's that makes it a lot more fun for me. Um, so, <laughs> folks, if you like what you heard, you want to hear more, you want to join our team, we'd love to have you. Uh, J O J two zero two zero. That's Joe J twenty twenty dot com. You can fill out the volunteer form. We'd love to have you as a volunteer. If you're able to make right. a contribution, we'd greatly appreciate it. There's a big donate button there. We'd love to have it. And we're doing the 38 for Spike campaign. Yesterday was my birthday. I turned 38. So if you go to 38forspike.com and donate $38 or you can donate whatever you want, but I'd like you to donate $38 or more, uh, then you can uh, make this birthday the happiest birthday I've ever had. And thank yep. you again for your time. Thank all you. Right. Thanks, Spike. We greatly appreciate it. And for all of you who are watching, we want to thank you for coming. We want to thank you for watching. Please go to libertariancounterpoint.com to catch past on all our past episodes. If you are happen to catch us on YouTube, please press the like buttons. It helps us with the algorithms and everything. And from the Counterpoint team, please remember to love everybody. This is Gail Morgan thanking you for watching The Libertarian Counterpoint each Thursday at 8 p.m. Channel 17 on Comcast, on YouTube, and on Facebook. We invite you to come again next week for The Libertarian Counterpoint.